came over the intercom and said, RVL, your daughter is on line one. She was probably 10 at the time. So she and I play back and forth little things. So I picked up the phone and I said, hello, this is the smartest man in the world. There was a long pause. And then this 10-year-old, Allison, said, I must have the wrong number, and hung up. <laughs> and God said, yeah, okay, remember who you are. We were driving across New York State not too long ago, and Allison and I, and as we were driving along, this sign whipped by. It said, Poughkeepsie, 20 miles. I said, Allison, we're almost to Poughkeepsie. She looked at the sign, and she said, it says Poughkeepsie. I said, Allison, I know that's how it looks, but they pronounce it around here, Poughkeepsie. She said, Dad, if they wanted to say Poughkeepsie, they would have spelled it differently. It's po you know how it is with somebody who's like 13? And you're going back and forth, back and forth. So I finally thought, I've got to show this kid. So the first exit we got to of Poughkeepsie, I said, Allison, we're going to settle this. So we pulled off, first exit of Poughkeepsie, made a right, pulled into a local establishment, drove up in the local establishment, and I said, Allison, come with me. She said, do I have to? I said, yes. She said, okay. We walked in. I walked up to the counter. A guy came to the counter, and I said to the guy, my daughter and I are having an argument. Can you please loudly and clearly pronounce the name of the place where we are? He said, yes. Taco Bell. <laughs> and, you know, Allison looked at me like, see, Dad, you're an idiot. Anyway, I'm so happy to be here, and I honestly mean that. I love teaching. I love the text. I love my Messiah. I try every day to be a Talmud, a disciple of him. Uh, to be invited here is very special for two reasons. One, I've become soulmates with many of the staff. They're awesome people who love Jesus with the same fire I feel, and it's neat to be part of that. I believe in Focus on the Family a great deal, not only because we work together, but because of what Focus on the Family represents. But most of all, I'm happy to be here because of you. You have no idea what is possible in this room. You do not. I will show you later this afternoon that it's very likely Jesus' disciples, all but one, were 15 when he picked them. It's highly unlikely any of his disciples were older than sophomores in high school. And he picked a group of kids, little kids. John may have been seven, eight, or nine. One of them failed, walked away from the program. The other 11 are the reason you're here today. Because those 11 15-year-olds lived with a fire in their chest for their rabbi. And you showed up here because of what they did. Now imagine if 88 of you, plus the guests that have joined us today, would have that same fire, that same belief in yourself, that same passion and belief in the rabbi, and would live it. The world wouldn't be the same. You are a unique group of people. I teach. I teach a little in college, a little in seminary, a lot in high school. You are unique. Very talented, experienced much more broadly than the average student, Many of you have already a passion for Jesus that is highly unusual. You guys could blow away the world. And for God to give me a few hours to share a few things that he's put in my soul is huge. Absolutely huge. And I would give up a lot of things to be here because of you. Now, maybe that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. We'll talk again later this afternoon. I'd like to ask you to stand up. If you were in the rabbinic classes where I got my training after college, through graduate school, you would always begin your study of the text with a commitment of who you are. They call it the Shema. Jesus said it often. It summarizes to God, to yourself, to each other, who you are and what you believe in. Say the Hebrew after me. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Say, now say, Echad. Now say the English together with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Amen. You guys are not Jewish. You're way too American, Western. Listen to me. This has to come out of your soul. This is who you are. And what is more important to you than anything else in the entire world? That you want to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And that is everything about you that matters. Say the Hebrew after me. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. 
Adonai Echad. Adonai Echad. Hero Israel. Hero Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your, soul. With all your might. With all your might. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Say these words from Isaiah after me. I have placed you in this land that you may be my witnesses that the world may know that I am God. Isaiah chapter 41. Please sit down. The second greatest rabbi in my experience is Akiba, was Akiba. Grew up in the same town Jesus taught in, but one generation later. How much he was influenced by Jesus' teaching is anyone's guess, but in many ways they were remarkably similar. The story is told of Akiba walking on the road along the shore of the Sea of Galilee early, early, late, 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 excuse me, one afternoon. And it was slowly getting dark. And Akiba was doing what Jewish believers in God almost always do when they have a free moment. Recite the text. And he was saying over and over and over and over again in his head, Isaiah chapter 41, You will be my witnesses, you will be my witnesses, you will be my witnesses. As it got dark, he came to a fork in the road. Wanted to turn left to go to the gate of the little town of Capernaum, where he lived. But he made a right turn by mistake and found himself standing in front of the gate of the Roman fortress. Just a small little fortress. They found it recently in that area, just outside of the gate of Capernaum. It was dark. As he stood in front of the gate, it startled him a little bit because it wasn't what he expected. The voice of the sentry on the wall boomed out of the darkness. Who are you? What are you doing here? was a stunned silence as Akiba tried to process who was shouting at him and why and where he was. And he said, what? Who are you? What are you doing here? This time Akiba's voice came back with a great deal more passion. What do you get, what do you get paid for asking me these questions? Now there was a long pause as the soldier tried to figure out who was shouting at him and why he was being asked what he got paid. And he said, three drachma a week. Akiba said, I'll give you double if you'll stand outside of my house and ask me those two questions every morning. Who are you? And what are you doing here? That is the fundamental question in the Jewish mind. The Jew of the Bible, believer or not, and the Jew of today, at least the religious Jew. Who are you? I mean, really, who are you? Who are you? And why are you here? And I don't mean, why are you in the Focus on the Family Institute? I can understand that. It's a great program. I mean, why are you here? Really? Why are you here? I'd like those two questions to be the platform today of what I would like to share with you. And honestly, coming out of a Jewish setting where they study and plan and organize and come with a well laid out program, the Jewish view is God decides what it is that's on the curriculum for the day. So what I want to do is to begin with sort of an organized approach to share with you something that I hope will re reset, reboot your thinking about a lot of things, but about how you view the Bible and its role in who are you and what are you doing here. Now some of it will be totally foreign to you. Some of it will feel really comfortable for you, even though you've never put a label on it. And some of it you'll say, well, I already knew that. That's common. That's who I am and what I I think. I want to show you what the Bible is and what it says, who Jesus was and what he said and did in the context of a Jewish world, which is diametrically different than what the Christian world has been in many ways. Now... I will talk nonstop all the time because I have so much I want to share with you. I have enough. I sat in the hotel room this morning looking at this thinking I need like four days to do this. So God is going to have to make some decisions. However, the best learning happens 
when you respond. Now, you're going to feel uncomfortable maybe because I'm a guest or I'm new. Maybe you won't. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Just shout out at the point you want to challenge what I'm saying, you want to disagree with what I'm saying. I've studied in the Jewish context, and they are not hesitant at all. They say, whoa, 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 whoa. So do it. If there are questions, ask them. And we'll let the Spirit decide where He's going to take us. Okay, let me walk you through a couple of things this morning as background, and then we'll get to what I call uh, the really fun stuff. I'd like to show you the presuppositions behind what I do. I'm part of a ministry called That the World May Know. You heard that in the Isaiah 41 passage this morning. The video series that Focus on the Family did, we took the title from that passage and others. The idea is, who are we? Well, that isn't in the title. But why are we here? That the world may know there is a God. That's my goal. But I'd like to show you what lies behind that. I love this old olive tree. It's on Mount Carmel in Israel. Could we dim the lights just a little bit, please? Thank you so much. It's about 18 to 1900 years old. So it was planted, sprouted shortly after Jesus died and ascended to heaven. In the Bible, the olive tree is the picture of God's people. It's rooted deeply in the ground. It never dies, so to speak. When the olive tree gets old, you can see it here, the farmer comes and cuts it off about every 400 years. Boom, cuts the whole thing down at about head level. When you see it, when I see it as a Westerner, I think, man, they just killed the tree. Next year, all new sprouts come out of the old stump. After three or four years, they pick off the ones they don't want, and all new sprouts come up, and you have a new olive tree, and the tree perpetuates itself. Jesus, of course, was the shoot out of Jesse's, Yishis, you say in Hebrew, Yishis, stump, and that's the image. Now, this was Israel. God's olive tree. Several times she got cut down because of failure to walk in God's ways. God cut it down for the last time in the Babylonian captivity. But God said, don't worry, my vineyard will come back to life. And out of Jesse's stump, one of many in the vineyard, in the orchard, out of that stump will come a shoot who will be the Messiah. That's the Jewish background. Now, in the New Testament, Paul says, you Jews, believers in Messiah Jesus are part of this stump. You have grown out of the shoot out of Jesse's stump. Let's imagine it's this one. You goy, you goyim, you non-Jews, God has picked you off a wild olive tree that never produced an olive in its life, and God grafted you in. And you have become a part of God's great tree. But the key for me is that you and I, as the grafted in branches, cannot exist without our Jewish roots. You cannot exist independently of Jesus, nor can you exist independently of your Jewish roots, because Jesus is not a tree. He is a shoot out of a tree, and the tree, humanly speaking, of course, the tree was Israel. And if this is you, or you and me, your roots and mine are Jewish. And that the Christian world has not only forgotten, but has done absolutely everything we can to obscure. And in the process, it isn't that we've gotten the Bible wrong. I'm not here to correct your theology. I'm a Christian. I'm an evangelical Christian with all my heart and all my soul and all my might. But in the process, what we've done is lost a significant part of what the Bible says and demands because we've looked at it apart from our Jewish roots. Now that's where I come from. And if you don't agree with my presuppositions, God bless you, let's debate them sometime. Then what I'm going to say today may not make a whole lot of sense to you, or you may not agree with it. And you need to know that. I want to treat you intellectually, honestly. That's where I come from. That's my perspective. Now with that in mind, bear with me please. I'd like to show you I always say in 15 minutes, usually ends up being like 50. Push me today, my wife isn't here. She's usually the one who sits back there going, or like this. I want to show you what that means. What does it mean to read the Bible in a Jewish context? In the world we live in, there are basically, this is oversimplified, but there are basically two ways of thinking. Two ways of approaching truth, of describing truth explaining truth. One 
is the Eastern approach. Now, by Eastern, you can say Oriental, you can say African, you can say Middle Eastern, even Eastern Europe, to a certain extent, is Eastern. So are American, Native Americans and Native, Native Indians in Central and South America. They think in an Eastern style. Then there is, on the other side, very different Western thinking. For lack of a better word, I call it Western. Greek would be a better description. Greek thinking is rooted in the civilization and the philosophy of the Greeks. Now, is there anyone here who did not attend school? Now, let me ask it differently. Is there anyone here who attended school in an Eastern setting? A native, native African school, a native Orient, okay. So you will be much more in tune with Eastern thinking. This is going to say, you're going to say, I knew this. This is obvious. This is easy. For me as a Westerner, it absolutely blew me away. I went to Israel kind of by God's accident, God's providence. Didn't even want to go, to be honest, and somebody gave me a gift. I went as I was finishing my master's degree, and I began to study, and it, I, I had to enter a college class. I felt very put down. You know, I'm in my last year of my master's, and they stuck me in a sophomore college class because they said, you don't know anything. It's like, give me a break. What do you mean I don't know anything? I have a degree. I did pretty well. You don't know anything. By the first week, I felt like such an idiot. I didn't know anything. And these kids knew all this stuff out of the Bible. It's like, where are you getting this? We're Hebrew. We're Eastern. What's the difference? Or what do we mean by thinking? Let me do this very quickly. Western culture has a perspective on how to view reality. That perspective is shaped by the culture we live in. Your culture, your educational background, your family background, your church background, all shape the glasses you wear as you come to the Bible. You read it as a Westerner. Okay? Now, as a result, when you read the text, your perspective, hopefully shaped by the text too, but your perspective shapes how you see the text. How is that different for an Eastern thinker versus a Western thinker? Well, let's take a Greek. Greeks, like you and me, are abstract thinkers. That is, we like to put information in definition and proposition. We like organization, point one, point two, point three, point four. My students tell me I'm a horrible organizer. They can't take notes from me at all because I'm all over the place. Well, maybe that's a character trait that I need to work on, and I do try to work on it. It's also because of my Jewish background. You don't organize in Eastern thinking. There's a very different way that information... You go through the life of Jesus once, take any teaching of his, and try and make an outline out of it. It'll drive you crazy. He didn't know how to outline. He forgets things, or maybe that's the wrong way if you want to say Jesus never forgot anything. Let's take Paul. He forgets things and stuck, sticks them in later. It's like Paul, get or Westerners want it abstract, clearly defined in words that carefully explain. I start most of my classes, seminary, college, high school, with this question. Who or what is God? Now, it's a little bit dangerous to do that here because I've already given you some information, but just... You, don't have, you won't feel stupid. I hope you do, by the way, because I felt stupid for so many years. It's kind of nice to drag other people. You know, most martyrs hated to go alone. They always bring folks along with them. Um, give me one word. If I say, who is God? Give me a word. Almighty. Almighty. Excellent. Holy. 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 Just. 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 Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. A little bit more Eastern. Go ahead. Another word. God is... Love. Okay, that's his name. That's excellent. That's Eastern also. But let's pick what we've, the few that we started with. Almighty, holy, just uh, love. Now, close your eyes. Those of you that haven't already. Okay, close your eyes, please. And when I say those words, you tell me what you see. God is holy. God is just. God is almighty. God is love. Okay, open your eyes. What did you see? Do you see what I mean? Those words are not picture words. Now, when I said God is almighty, somebody said, I saw the Grand Canyon. Okay, but that's a stretch because you've got to say, okay, the Grand Canyon, God created it, therefore God... The word almighty is not a picture. The word love is not a picture. The word truth or love or honesty or justice or eternity is not a picture. It's a definition, and it's a very good one and a very biblical one. 
But students in, a Western, in Western thinking always put information abstractly. So they answer, God, answer the question, who is God, with a word that can't be pictured. It's a true word, but it's abstracted out of life. Now, does the devil know God is holy? You bet. Does the devil know God is love? You bet. Does the devil know God is almighty? What difference is there between your knowledge of God and his? And the result of Greek thinking is that you don't have to make a value commitment to the information. It's just information. It's great information. It's true information. It's precise information. And I hope all of you knew it. Some student will eventually say, God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. And the other kids will go, ooh, you know, how do you know that? But it's, it's, it's good. That's a good thing to know. But you don't have to believe anything. It's all here. Why is it that so many of you go to Christian colleges and nobody ever stands up in the middle of class and says, Yes! God is awesome! Because we're scholars. I don't feel anything about that. It's just information. Wow, that's interesting. Get it down. Could you spell that, please? T-H-A-T. It's, it's... Okay, now... And I'm not knocking the information. Please, God is almighty. I believe it with all my heart. He is omnipotent. I believe it with all my heart. But it's information. The Easterner doesn't understand this at all. That's not how they think. An Easterner, and let's call it Hebrew, although it's African and Oriental, every bit as much. An Easterner, notice I put it the right way this time. An Easterner always thinks concretely in the form of story or picture. So I go to a Jewish school, and I've done this, with high school students. And I say to the kids, the Jewish kids, who is God? Boom, they don't raise their hands because in a Jewish school you just all talk at once. That's a more Eastern thing too. You know, we all see Jesus sitting there in this big crowd of people, silent as you are, all taking notes on their, um, on their papyri, uh, with, with a, I don't know what. They're all talking to him at the same time. And he's talking here and somebody's talking. It's Eastern. Anyway, who is God? Oh, that's, oh, God is a shepherd. God is a rock. God is my shade. God is my living water. God is my bread. God is like my nursing mother. God is my father. God is my brother. And it's always my. Now, can the devil say God is my rock? Can the devil say God is my sister, my brother? Can the devil say God is my bread, my water, my shade? That's Eastern. The Eastern mind... Who's got a Bible? Turn your Bible to, to Mark 4, 24. This drives me crazy. If I had a hat, I would throw it. It drives me crazy because in the West, we don't know what to do with these Hebrew expressions in the Bible. There's this view that the New Testament was written in Greek. Maybe it was. The evidence is far greater that the New Testament was written in Hebrew, or at least orally passed in Hebrew, and then later somebody translated it to the Greek. I spent a summer, most of one summer for my devotions, translating Mark from Greek to Hebrew. In, Hebrew, in Greek, Mark is terrible Greek. Oi, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a C in college Greek for way Mark wrote. It's inspired, it's the very word, but it's poor, poor Greek. But when you translate Mark into Hebrew, it's classic Hebrew. Somebody read Mark 4.24a, the first phrase. Stop. Once more. This is the Jewish way, by the way. It doesn't mean you read. You always say three times. Read it again. Stop. Once more. Consider carefully what you hear. Isn't that cool? You know what the Greek says? Look at carefully what you hear. How can you look at what you hear? You can if it's a picture. God is my shepherd. Look at it. Look at it. Do you see it? Which sheep are you? The one in the middle of the flock or the one off butting somebody? Where are you with the shepherd? You got your back to him or is your nose right at his feet because you don't want to miss the group? Do you see it? Look at what you hear, Jesus said. That's a Hebrew. What is the, what is the Hebrew word for bread? Okay? I don't know if there's anybody who's taken Hebrew. Lachem. What is the Hebrew word for house? 
place. Thank you. Bet. Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? Place of, what's a place of bread? A bakery. What did Jesus call himself? The bread of life. And where was he born? In a bakery. Now that makes a Westerner laugh. It's, oh, come on, that's Stephen Wright kind of humor. Listen, that's God. The bread of the world has to be born in a bakery. Do you know that the light of the world was probably conceived on the Feast of Lights? He was born in a bakery. He was laid in a manger. The water, the living water was laid in a manger. You know what a manger is? A manger is not for hay or straw. We always see hay or straw in it. A manger in the Hebrew is for water. Living water. The light of the world was conceived on the Feast of Lights probably. Born and laid in a water trough, the living water. And he was in a bakery. You can see that stuff. And part of the dilemma for Western thinkers is we're poured all this religious stuff into us and it never gets below here because it's information and it's not experience God says here it is the story it's called the text but it's not about learning the details of the story it's come on join it They didn't cross the Red Sea. We did. They didn't wander in the wilderness. We did. They didn't worship idols. We did. They weren't delivered. We were. Join the story. It's your story and mine. But you've got to see it. I remember going, being in Israel that first week or two, and, and they harassed me nonstop. Think Hebrew. Will you think like a Hebrew... You, you Westerners know so much and you don't know anything. Think like a Hebrew. Think like... And it frustrated me no end because A, I was proud of the knowledge I had, which I think you should be, proud in, in a godly sense. And B, I didn't like being put down by these college sophomores. Finally, one day I stopped the whole class, which is unusual because usually if you don't know anything, you don't say anything. I stopped the whole class and I said, look, you guys always harass me. It was all guys because it was a rabbinic, it was Orthodox Jewish. The Chosen, have you read The Chosen? That was the world I was in. I said, stop harassing me. I don't want to hear it again until you can tell me what thinking Hebrew is. Now, what was I asking for? I want a definition. Give me a definition of thinking Hebrew. And they all laughed. I didn't understand why they laughed. So, the guy next to me turned to me and he said, what do you think causes juvenile delinquency? It's like, oh, now I'm a juvenile delinquent too. I'm stupid. And I, no, tell me what he... So I thought, okay, well, a lot of stuff I suppose. Maybe if parents don't teach their children uh, appropriate behaviors and moral values, they could... So I said, maybe it has something to do with parents. If they don't train their children right, they could become juvenile delinquents. Okay, he said, ask me. Ask you what? Ask me... What causes juvenile delinquency? Okay, what causes you? He made me ask, what causes juvenile delinquency? He said, if the father eats raw onions and the mother chews on garlic, don't expect the children's breath to smell nice. What did he just say caused juvenile delinquency? What the parents do. He said the same thing. Now, who does that sound like? Does that sound like Jesus? That's what I want you to catch a vision of today. I don't want to undo what you've learned. I don't want to undermine your theology. Believe it with all your heart, and I hope it's in your heart, not only your head. I want you to see, when you put the Bible into the context where God put it, there's stuff in it you can't imagine that grabs you, not here, although it takes a lot of this to get here. Does that sound African? If the mother eats onions and the father eats sound oriental? Okay. It's Eastern. Put it in a... Yes, sir. The Greek thinkers elevated the rational. They Let me oversimplify. And we got these great Christian philosophers here so they can come back and correct my philosophy later, although that was my college major, but that was before I knew anything. Um, the Greek philosophers said the human being is God. And one of the four qualities of the human being that they elevated to the throne is the mind. 
And the moment you elevate the throne, the mind to the throne, information is prior to experience. And that's the roots of Greek thinking. It, it, it's Anyway, let, let me give you a few concrete examples of that. Try and be a little bit more... So what? You say, so how does that affect the Bible? Well, to a Hebrew, numbers are first of all symbols. They communicate information, data, but they're first of all symbols. To a Greek, numbers are first of all quantity. David and Goliath, one of the first Bible stories most of you ever learned. Okay? Oh, you guys are so Western. You know, you know what I would do if I was a rabbi? I would ask this whole class to get up, to walk over to the corner, and throw your pens in the trash. Honestly. And I, I bless that you want to write this down. In the writing, don't be Western. Because the Westerner says, I got the information. I can go back and learn. The Easterner says, what are you experiencing at this moment? Is your soul being drawn into God? Or has your mind become that you can't feel what's going on? We were not allowed to take notes when we went out to study the... T- Don't take notes! That's the brain. Think with your heart. Now, you can take notes. <laughs> but listen. Story of David and Goliath. Starts out, Goliath from Gath, which is such a... Uh, that's another time. Goliath from Gath is six cubits tall. Now, be honest. You're Westerners. What's your question? What's a cubit? You want to know how tall the guy was. Nine foot six. I believe that's true. That's in the Bible. I take the Bible as inspired. Then it says his armor, his, um, yeah, his armor weighed 60 shekels. And your question is? Then there's a textual variant. So one version has one or one has the other. But I think the best version is his um, spear point weighed 6,000 talents. And your question is? Now the Jew says, wait a minute. Why didn't he tell us what the helmet weighed? Why didn't he tell us what the sword weighed? Why did he pick those three? Well, if Goliath had a uniform on, played for, I don't care, wherever you come from, what would his number have been? Six. 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 And the writer has just told you, not what Goliath is, that's an Eastern thing, a Western thing. The writer has told you who he is. Who is Goliath? Six cubits. Six. In Hebrew, there are no numbers. Um, They use our numbers today. But to say 60, you have to have the six. And then add the ten. To say 6,000, you have to have the six. And then the thousand. So you've, in the Hebrew text, you have three sixes. Six cubits, six T shekels, six thousand. So his numbers are six, six, six. Which means? The devil. This guy is of the devil. The writer wants you to know this isn't about a little guy beating a big guy. This is about the devil and God. And how does David kill him? With a, okay, bless you for saying that, but that is so stinking Western. I know what he did, I know the information. What with the rock? Where does he hit him? Now, what did God promise to Eve? Someday, the descendant of Eve, that is the follower of God, would do to the descendant of Satan. Crush his. And when a Jewish kid in third grade reads that story, they say, yes! God's promise in Genesis 3 is still true. It's still happening. Look, the follower of God destroyed the follower of the snake with a stone right in his head. Just like God's. And you know what? Westerners go to seminary. And they come out saying he was six, nine foot six tall. His spear point weighed 18 pounds. And his armor weighed 56 pounds. Which is true. But so What? The picture, the picture, the picture. There's another story, this is off the subject, 
See, this is God's curriculum. Curriculum is what the teacher plans. Interruption is God's curriculum. That's a kiva. Do you remember a woman named Devorah? Deborah. Devorah. Deborah. What does Deborah mean in Hebrew? So we don't even think that was... It's Deborah. Debbie, probably, right? Deborah. Devorah means a honeybee. And honey is always the picture, the sweetness of God. Deborah is a honeybee. And she goes to war against a pagan. Yavin, his name is. King of Hatzor. Because the general of the army is a guy named... Who does Deborah fight with? Not against, with. Just be stupid and say it. Very good. Thank you. Who said it? Good man. In Hebrew you say Barak. Anybody know what Barak means? Lightning. Boom. Lightning is scared to death. So honeybee says, I'll do it. You laugh in in Hebrew when you think that. The honeybee can do what lightning can't because lightning's a wimp. So anyway, they go to war and they win. And the commander of the pagan army is a guy named Sisera. You remember Sisera? And he's riding for his life. He gets in his chariot and he rides off to the heights of Menasha, riding for his life, because he's probably the only one left. The army's after him, and he gets exhausted, and there's a tent, Bedouin. So he thinks, I've got to get some rest, and then I'll go down that steep bank and up on the east, and I'll be away. So she knocks on the tent. Of course, nobody hears her because you can't hear when you knock on canvas. But she stands by the tent and says, hey, anybody home? Sure enough, there's a woman in the tent. What's her name? Yael, Jael, Yael, Yoel, ja, uh, Yael, the same thing. Yael is, Yael is the woman, femi- feminine. Um, Joel is, is masculine. What does that mean? Pardon? Okay, you're, I, I love the way you said that, and I hope you said it out of respect. This means God in Hebrew, El, and Yah is the first, fra- the first syllable of Yahweh. So, Yael means Yahweh is God. So, Sisera says, Yahweh is God. That's the pagan. Yahweh is God. Can I rest here? She says, oh, yeah, I'll give you some warm milk. Go ahead. Here's some, and warm meant, by the way, they didn't heat it up. It meant it just came out of the goat. So, it's fresh, fresh milk in English. Here's some, so he drinks some milk. He falls asleep. What does Yael do to Sisera? How? Put a nail through his... You know what the word Sisera means? Snake. How would the descendant of the serpent be killed? The descendant of God would crush his head. If I was named Sisera, you couldn't have paid me enough if I was a pagan to go in the tent of a woman named Yahweh is God. You know what's going to happen. You're going to get your head snake. He should have known, honestly. Now, I didn't change any of the details of that story. All I did is to say to you, read it like a Jew. So you come away saying, man, I want to be on Yael's side in this thing. I don't want to be on Sisera's side because every generation, it's the same. Um, Oh, man. Do I want to do that or not? Okay, we'll do this one. Another one that I sat in a Jewish class. Now, you need to understand, I went to class the first day, and it was a doctoral program. So I went through, the, when I started enrolling, the guy said to me, you can't be in here. Well, why not? Well, you're not Jewish. It's like, well, that's discrimination. He said, no, you don't get the point. You don't know anything. Well, here's my grades. Here's my experience. What do you look at? Well, I went to class the first day, 32 of us. 31 had black with the tzitzit from under their jackets, um, kippah, peyote, and one guy with polo shirt and dockers sitting in the back hoping nobody looked at him. And I discovered within an hour or so that there were 31 men in that room who knew the Old Testament by memory. Every single word. And if you would give them a short phrase in the middle of a book without telling them what book or what chapter or what verse, they'd give you the verse before. 
I had a group of students and adults, like students were younger than you, they're high school seniors mostly. We were visiting a synagogue. We had looked at the synagogues of Jesus' time, and it was such, so powerful to see what Jesus did in the synagogue of Nazareth in Luke 4, um, if you understand synagogue. And so we visited a modern Orthodox synagogue called Hoshia in northern, uh, Lower Galilee. And the kids were looking at you know, all the same stuff, the Bema, the Moses seat, and all that stuff. And as we were looking around, it was on a Tuesday, I think, so there was nobody in there. A school bus broke down in front of the synagogue. And a group of 8th graders came in, about 15, 18 of them, just kind of wandering in to see all these strange Americans with their fanny packs and, and, and packs and hiking gear and all that kind of stuff, because we do a lot of um, hiking. We don't, it's not a tour. And um, so one of the kids said to me, are these the kind of kids that would know a lot of the Old Testament by memory? I'm like, oh, okay, here I get put to the test. I said, maybe, probably. So let's ask them. So they brought them over and... Kids gathered around, you know, eager eighth graders. By the way, what I should also tell you is they did exactly what eighth graders in this country would do. Their bus had broken down, so they're waiting for another bus to come and take them to school. And so they did what our eighth graders do in our Christian high school. They all took out their Bibles and began to memorize, just exactly the same as all of our eighth graders. They're always, every free moment, they're memorizing the text. So our kids began to ask questions. Who were Aaron's, who were Aaron's wives? Well, the Bible only mentions one. Boom, they rattle off the verse. Who were Aaron's two sons? Or they didn't know it was two sons. Who were Aaron's kids? Boom, they rattle off the verse. Hophni and Pinchas. Boom, there it is. And I said, ask him a tough question. So, of course, it was from Hebrew to English and English to Hebrew. But I said, ask him a tough question. So one kid said, what birds are mentioned in the Torah? And that group of eighth graders started with pigeon and could go through the first five books of the Bible and recite every single verse that mentioned pigeon. People, honestly, before God, and I've already complimented you today, we don't know anything about the Bible. We don't. In comparison to them. I sat in this Jewish class with these 31 and the prof was so gracious because he would be drawing on examples and he would say, okay, 12 and 7, here's the meaning of those numbers, really profound. And so he'd turn and say, Goy, Gentile, Gentile in the back there, it's in your book, your rabbi, Yeshua ben Yosef, he used this, right? Why don't you tell us about it? I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know, 12 and I don't ever remember. This is the world of Jesus. Up here, I don't know if I put that on there or not. Yeah, Jesus lived up in the upper left corner most of his life. The rabbis called it the land of the twelve. Why? Because everybody who lived there was a religious Jew. Now, were they all born again? Well, they didn't use that language, but that was a very righteous community and godly people. So they said, we're like the twelve tribes of Israel. We're God's people. This is a Christian community. Well, not Christian, but Jewish, believing community. So they called it the twelve. On this side lived all the pagans. Not the motorcycle gang, not Jews who didn't believe in God, but pagans meaning people who um, were Greek or Roman, Gentiles. And the rabbis called that the land of the seven. Ask me if you're interested later or any time why they called seven. Seven is God's number. You wouldn't think so. But that's the home of the seven pagan nations. Now, in the book of Mark, Jesus has two feeding miracles. The first time he fed 5,000 people, plus women and children, which is a Jewish way to say it, here. Then he fed 4,000 here. When he fed five, and then he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of the world, actually, in this case. When he fed the 5,000, how many baskets of leftovers? When he fed the 4,000, how many baskets of leftovers? And what was Jesus saying? I am the bread of life for the Jew. I am the bread of life for it's the picture. Now, eventually one of my students, high school kids especially, are very perceptive about this, will raise their hand and say, if the Bible wanted to say Jesus was the bread of the world for the Jew and Jesus was the bread of the world for the Gentile, why didn't it just say it? The answer to which is, he did. He said it loudly and clearly, like a Jew. Or how about this one? And this is new to me, 
So I'm still wrestling through this. Matthew, Matita Yahu in Hebrew, gift of God, God's gift, Yahu, Yahweh. Matthew has a genealogy of Jesus, which if you look at it carefully, isn't real good because he left people out and he's got one generation represented three times. That's why it's very difficult to get the dates of the Bible by following genealogy. People say the Bible is 4,000 so many B.C. Well, they add up all the numbers, but genealogists are not bound to list everybody, and sometimes they list three or four people in one generation to make their point. But if you follow Matthew's account of Jesus' genealogy, now it's in Greek, okay? although I think it's Hebraic, very Hebrew word order, and the words are, are very Hebrew, the names, of course, that would be obvious. The number of words in Jesus' genealogy is evenly divisible by seven. God's number. The number of words that begin with a vowel is evenly divisible by seven. The number of words beginning with a consonant, therefore, is evenly divisible by seven. The number of letters is evenly divisible by seven. The number of vowels is evenly divisible by seven. The number of consonants is evenly divisible by seven. The number of words that occur more than once is evenly divisible by seven. The number of words that occur only once is evenly divisible by seven. The number of nouns is evenly divisible by seven. The number of non-nouns is evenly divisible by seven. Number of proper names evenly divisible by seven. Male names, female names. The number of words beginning with each letter of the alphabet is evenly divisible by seven. And if you add up the value of all the letters because they don't have numbers, it's evenly divisible by seven. Now you write me one sentence where any of that is true. You can't do it. It would take either Matthew was an incredible literary guy, or you've got to say the Holy Spirit just gave that to him. Now I'm not talking here the Bible code. That's a totally what I'm saying is what is Matthew saying about Jesus? Where'd this guy come from? From God, seven 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 seven, and there's probably a lot, a lot more. I don't know. Um, off the subject question, but I'll address it very briefly. I have two problems with the Bible code. Notice that what I'm doing is not saying there is mystical information hidden in the Bible by taking sequences um, out of the context of the book. If there are things in the Bible, like numbers, they're in the context in a specific way. It's not like the Bible is a Ouija board. I have a real problem with the Bible code for that reason. But a much bigger issue in the Jewish world is we don't have the original text. We do not have the actual version penned by the author. And if even one letter is different, and words change in spelling, like in English, the word plow and the word plow... If one letter changes in the entire book, the whole Bible code falls apart because your sequences are lost. And so until we find the original version, the original document, we don't know. It just is simply not provable. This is not Bible code stuff. 